Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. There was a great analogy right after I had written this last night. How many of you enjoyed the heat for the last three days? <clears throat> it's just not, uh, it wasn't very comfortable, right? And I remember the first days of that heat wave, you go outside in the morning and you couldn't hardly breathe. It was like so close. But then I love weather. I get so disappointed when they forecast thunderstorms and they don't come. Now, I'm not looking for destruction, but I, I love what God does. And so last night was, was a little bit better, I said to the Lord. <clears throat> so uh, I saw that my neighbor was outside too, across the street, when those dark clouds started coming. How many, how many saw that? And, uh, and then all of the lightning started happening, and, and when it rained, I had to go onto the porch and... You just keep praying, Lord, don't strike me. <laughs> and, when, and, 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 you know, you, if you ever start feeling that little feeling of you know, the hair coming up on your back, hit the ground because you know something's about to happen. But guess what happened today? I mean, see that, that, that front came through, nice fresh air. Isn't that like God? We can have oppression and we can have things happening in our lives, but maybe through a storm... He clears the way, and he makes us new. Isn't that God? Amen. Amen. So we're talking about today the total blueprint makeover. <laughs> what does God want to do to, to take his blueprint and, and help us to be better at working it? Okay? And the foundation for this message is a couple of different points. Number one, God's blueprint, blueprint is perfect. How many understand that? When, when we have it, it is the right thing to follow. When we, when we follow it, it works for us, doesn't it? Secondly, but our execution of God's blueprint is severely flawed. We just don't do it. It has been subject to our fleshly desires and selfish rewriting of the blueprint for our own benefit. We tend to rewrite how we want to do life. We, we rewrite how we want to do marriage. We rewrite how we want to parent our kids instead of following God's blueprint. And you've heard Pastor Ryan's heart, you know, from the beginning of this uh, series. Third, God's love has been a catalyst in trying to get us back to his original blueprint so that we can live godly and productive lives for him and our family. So the catalyst is God's love. He wants us to come back to him and do it his way. But finally, God's target for a total blueprint makeover is us as individuals. It's me. If God wants to make over our lives, our marriage, our kids, it starts with me. So if you have somebody close to you that you're married to, just nudge them and say, see, it's all about you, not me. Because <laughs> that's, that's what we want to say, right? So it, it starts with us. Why is that? Because God influences us as individuals, and then we influence our spouse, and then we as a couple influence our kids, or if you're a single mom or a dad, you influence your kids, and our kids will influence future generations. It's God's blueprint. And he is passionate about this. How many of you heard Pastor and Angela the last couple of weeks? Not, not too many. Okay, that's all right. all right. If you listen to their testimonies, they're really, really powerful. And I learned something about the Coons I didn't know before, and I'd been working with them for 30-some years. They aren't perfect. I didn't know that. Well, I did, because they will readily admit that. But isn't it neat, the testimony of every, every one of us has a testimony of the flaws that we have in our own lives. And when I was listening to Pastor and Angela, several lessons were glaring to me. Number one, no matter how we think things were in our lives, the impact it can have on us is significant. We can be in denial all we want. We can say, I came from a perfect childhood. Maybe some of you did. 
But the majority of people that say they did, didn't. But it impacts us anyway, doesn't it? Another thing I learned is it does not matter what we've experienced, we've ever experienced in our lives. God is into change today. It does not matter where you've been. It does not matter what you did yesterday or last month or last year or throughout your lives. God changes us today for a better tomorrow. We are new every day. And I'm going to tell you how in a minute. God moves us into the future guilt-free. We don't have to hold on to shame and guilt. The third thing was God can use us no matter what we've experienced in our lives. <laughs> Listen, if he can use me, he can use anybody. Don't ever be discouraged and think that God can't use you because maybe you've been damaged. Maybe there's something that has happened in your life. But that is not true. God uses us anyway. And you've heard pastor's testimony. You've heard Angela's testimony. You've heard mine in some respects here. And I'll share a little bit more. The reality is this. God does not define us by what we have experienced or the decisions we have made. He doesn't define us by that. He sees us different than we see ourselves. When I look in the mirror, I see myself and what God sees is what he created us to be. I think it's Robert McGee that said this one time. He said, who you think you would like to become is already far less than what you already are. And that is pretty profound. It's like you think we want to change. I want to be a different person. I want to cover my mistakes. I want to get past with the past. I want to do this. But you know what? He, he's already made you new. We're not defined by what we've been through. But yes, fallen human beings have a problem, right? Is anybody human in here? We all have one problem. And what I feel is one of the most corrosive and destructive mindsets that we ever have in our lives that I want to address today. It is destructive, it is corrosive, and it has a, a consistent shame attached to it. And it's something we want to get rid of today. It's one word, regret. Regret is, I believe, one of the most corrosive and destructive mindsets with its constant and overwhelming shame. Let me define regret for you in a minute, right now. It is to think of with a sense of loss. It is defined as to feel sorrow or remorse for. It is a feeling of sorrow or remorse for a fault, act, loss, disappointment, etc. And regrets can come in so many different forms. We can have career decisions that we regret. We can have parenting decisions that we regret. We can have personal decisions or relationship decisions that we regret. We can have experiences we have had. We can mistakes that we have made or shortcomings that we have can be regrets. I've shared with Dorothy that one of the greatest regrets is that I was shaped by my parents growing up. And the reason I say that is because I thought I had everything together and, and I was healing and everything was fine and, we, and then I got married. <laughs> Anybody ever got married and find out, oh, I got some stuff to work on. I thought it was her. She was the one that was causing me to have these issues. And so what happened is I just didn't do what I needed to do. I wasn't emotionally connecting. I wasn't doing the right things. And the, the kids, she was taking care of the kids. And I was doing what my dad did, which was sit in a lounge chair and just watch TV or to read or do whatever, but not being engaged in the family. And then Dorothy came up to me one day that changed my life. And she said these words. I'm done. A nine o'clock had a better reaction to that. <laughs> now, she didn't say that she was done in the marriage, but she was done with the way it was going to work. We've kind of shared this before in a, in a marriage retreat, so, so for some of you, this is familiar. But I had to do business with God. 
because I got scared enough to know that she wasn't leaving me, but I did not want her to be unhappy. And I could easily shift that blame. Well, you know what? And, and I see a lot of people doing that. And if you are doing this, stop. You know, the reason I do what I do is your fault. It is not the person sitting next to you. That's not God's blueprint. God's blueprint and the makeover begins with us as individuals. But I had so much regret about that in the later years. That, you know, several, several years ago, I think it was Christmas time, when the kids were in the house, and I really felt strongly that I needed to apologize for those years. And it's not like they were abused. I, it was, I was emotionally absent. As a man, I just didn't feel like I had that emotional connection because my dad was a winner, winner, chicken dinner when it came to that one. I don't know, maybe that's an old phrase, but that didn't go over well either. He was a piece of work because I never got any emotional connection from him. And I learned very poorly how to, how to do marriage, how to do family, God's blueprint. And I got to tell you something. You cannot, and Pastor Kuhn has said this one time, you cannot come in front of an almighty God and come out the same. You are going to change if you want it to work. But re regret was killing me. And it will kill us all. All right? Why is regret so destructive? It's because one simple thing, we cannot go back and change a thing. You cannot go back. None of us has a DeLorean to go back to the future. <laughs> Michael J. Fox can do that, but we can't. Hollywood can do that, but the reality is we can't go and change anything in our lives. And so regret and shame st stays with us. And what it does is it robs us of our peace. It locks us in the past. It robs us of hope for the future. It treats us with an unforgiving and destructive view of ourselves. It is a preoccupation of shame and a constant focus on past mistakes and failures that defines us today. It is dominated by fear of being a failure. I am here to tell you today that God wants to set us free from any regret that we have ever had in our entire lives because he makes it new today. The bottom line is we cannot change the past, but we can live in God's redemption today in order to have hope for a new tomorrow. It is time that we look at our lives not from the lens in the rearview mirror, but we look at it from looking straight ahead and looking at the GPS of where God wants us to be and what he has created us to be, which is already much greater than anything that you could have been defined by before. Amen? Amen. I got to tell you, I'm feeling it. God wants to do something. He is passionate about this thing of regret. But here's the good news. Does anybody want some good news now? The greatest antidote to regret is repair. To repair something is to get past regret. See, this is a piece of paper, right? So what happens when I tear it? Can anybody put this back together in its original form? No. The molecular structure has been changed forever. But I know a God that takes any wound that we have ever had, anything that we have ever experienced, and he makes it new. And he takes it and makes it new in a greater way than what we ever were in the past. Repair simply is... The ability to make things right by God's help in order to disarm regret's power. Repair is there to regret, to disarm regret's power. It makes things right. It doesn't return us to where we were before. When God moves us forward, he didn't say to the, to the Israelites, all right, I want you to remember Egypt as we get to the promised land. The problem is they kept focusing on Egypt and they never made it into the promised land because they regretted, not go, not, they regretted God giving them out of there. 
Don't ever regret where God has taken you. Even through adversity, God moves us. Because we're all in it. Together. Let's look at the difference between regret and, and repair, okay? Now, don't try to write all this stuff down. It's all going to be in the after sermon notes online, okay? Go to the events page on, on, on the website or on the uh, app, and, and you'll have all of these notes will be written down, so you don't have to worry about taking notes. I want you to pay attention. <laughs> so we have it for you. You will have every, every word that I have on my outline. All right, so here's the difference between regret and repair. Regret says, I am defined by what I did. Repair says, I am defined by what God sees. Re regret says, I wish I could change the past. Repair says, I could be different today in order to change the course of tomorrow. Regret says, I am stuck and can't move forward. Repair says, I am free to be different. Regret says, I am preoccupied and dwell on failures and mistakes. But repair says, I am free to, sh to start fresh and change the course of the future. Regret says, I am heavy in my soul. But repair says, I am released from the weight on my soul. Finally, regret says, I am defective. Repair says, I am redeemed. <laughs> I am not defective. I am not defective. I am redeemed. I'm redeemed by the love of God. And you sang it today. You know the goodness of God. And you know the love of God. And the faithfulness of God. He wants to set us free. Amen. you got to see it. It's what I, I have I've studied Here's one made, well, our hope, where our hope comes from is one major truth. Listen to me carefully. When we talk about repair, here's the one truth I want us to understand. God is the greatest repairer ever. <laughs> He's the one that makes it right. We can't do it anymore. We are never going to be able to change our lives in the past. We're never going to be able to heal those regrets. But we will allow God to change us today so we're redeemed for tomorrow. And it is God's love that does that. So if God is the greatest repairer ever, what should our attitude be? How can God repair us? Here it is. And I'm glad you asked that question. Our attitude is seen, and this is, this is what we want to talk about in, the, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. There is a scripture here where Paul is talking about the Corinthian church. He's addressing something in his second letter that he addressed in the first letter. And in, in, in if you read 1 Corinthians 5, you will see that Paul was actually rebuking the church because there was an immoral brother in the church. And he, and they, he told them, you've got to get rid of it. You've got you to kick him out. Why are you keeping him there? All right? So he comes back because the church apparently really did heed what, they were, what he was saying. And he comes back in 2 Corinthians 7, starting in verse 8, it says this. Even if I cause you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to what? Repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so you were not harmed in any way by us. Look at verse 10. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no what? Regret. When you are sorrowful in a godly way, there is no regret. I don't have to have false guilt. I can actually exercise God's love in my life. But it says worldly sorrow brings death. You know, worldly sorrow brings death. It's almost like there's the difference between I am truly, truly, truly heartfelt sorry versus I'm sorry that I got caught.
I mean, how many of you have ever had your spouse or you've said to your spouse, I'm sorry, but the same thing keeps happening over and over again? You know, it, it almost then takes those words down a bit. But listen to verse 11. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you? What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourself, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done? At every point you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. Wow. Folks, if you are looking for the model of, of, of being sorrowful, this is it. If you really want to know how I can redeem trust in my relationships after a hurt, this is it. To express godly sorrow. Now, there are four attitudes that I see in this scripture. Number one is the attitude of change. Godly sorrow brings repentance. What is repentance? It's a deep heart change. It's a 180 directional change. It says, I will no longer do what I have done before. With God's help, I am going to recover and be different. It changes us. I mean, every one of us has had to come to the Lord with that same sorrow. Secondly, the attitude of repair. Godly sorrow leads to salvation. So the first thing is, I change who I am. It leads to salvation. God then repairs the breach between God and us, and it becomes our strength to continue to change. It's repair. Third, it is the attitude of peace. Godly sorrow leaves no regret. It leaves no regret. But the last attitude is the attitude of passion. It is a passion. Think of the passion of verse 11. When you're sorrowful, listen to what it says again. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. The key to godly sorrow is that it leaves no regret and it is so passionate that I'm making myself right before others and God. That's what I had to do. But when it becomes passionate, it becomes permanent. <laughs> Isn't that fascinating? If it is not passionate and you're just saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It ain't freeing. It ain't freeing you. We're still bound by the old dynamics. So all of this is a response to God's love for us. God's love for us is the repair that we need when we understand anything that we've ever experienced. You see, if we truly experience God's love, shame and regret have to run. If you are truly experiencing God's love, shame and regret, regret have to run. And this is the thing that I want to say, and I'm going to, I'm going to bring up a quote that just, it just hit me when I was preparing this. And, and I had to write it down real quick. I wasn't, I wasn't anywhere to write it down because usually in the shower is where I get a lot of this stuff. And I said, there's not enough steam on the thing to write this stuff out. I got to hurry up and get out of here. But this really hit me. And here's what, I, here's what it, it came out to me. It says, when our shame is greater than our perception of God's love, we have a problem. But when our experience of God's love is greater than any shame we may have, we will experience freedom. So notice what I'm saying is that it is the perception of God's love that is overwhelmed by your shame. You don't know it yet. You haven't developed that perception. You still have to read the word. You have to get discipled. You have to try to grow in the Lord so that your perception changes so that when the experience of God's love hits you and you apply the scriptures, you know that you know that you know that that shame is gone because you know who you are in Christ. I just love the Lord. Don't you love the Lord? Amen. Let me, let me just give you a few scriptures. And some of these are very common, but I want us to understand we have to apply these. Let's apply them personally. It's all about us. All right? Listen to Romans 5.8. We've, know, we've known this scripture. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That, to me, is powerful. 
What does it say? Is that we didn't do anything to deserve it. It is God's love demonstrated when he sent Christ to the cross. And then when he says it is finished, it is that perfect mating together with God's love in us. Did you know that's for you? Do you know it's for you? It's for you. This is, you, you can't do the yeah buts anymore. Because we always read the scripture with the yeah buts. Yeah, but that doesn't apply to me. Yes, it does. Because God's blueprint, blueprint is perfect. And it's for every single person on the face of this planet. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, I first memorized that in the King James. All right, Romans 8, 38 and 39, it says, For I am convinced, Paul says this, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You have got to absorb that. That means there is nothing that you can do. You can't even go to the throne of God and say, stop loving me because I'm ashamed. No, there is nothing that will separate you from the love of God. You can't stop him from loving you. It ain't happening. <laughs> I love Kurt Thompson. Kurt Thompson talks a lot about shame in his book, The Soul of Shame. And, and I, I, I was in a workshop one time, and, and he said he was, he was kind of quoting the scripture um, that we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And he says, you will never understand that scripture unless you understand this, that for you to fix your eyes on Jesus is to see Jesus fixing his eyes on you. That gives me goosebumps. It isn't just we do all the work. You know, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. But it is Jesus looking back at you. Can you see his eyes looking back at you? Can you see that his love is so great that it covers any shame you have ever had and any regret that you've ever had in your life? It is God's love that causes us to live a new tomorrow. Ephesians 3. Paul said this, it was a prayer for the Ephesians. And for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in, my, in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. You can't figure it out and that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. You are, me you are full of the measure of the fullness of God because you understand all of what God's love is all about. This is another scripture here, Psalm 103. And it's my favorite four verses, so um, five verses. And I've said this all the time. I say it, you know, I just I keep repeating this. I have it memorized. But listen carefully. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. Verse 10, he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. There is no way that God is going to pay you back for what you have done. That when Christ paid the price, he paid it for all. You cannot go to the Lord and say, you can't possibly forgive me. You can't go to the Lord and say, I'm not good enough for you. You can't go to the Lord and say, I've done so much in my life, you can't possibly forgive me. Because that is false humility, and it does not work. Because Christ died for every single one of you. 
He does not treat us as our sins deserve, nor does he repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Do you realize what that means? When you ask God, how much do you love me? And he says, well, look at Psalm 103. It says, as far as the earth is to the heavens. I don't know if you could ever measure that. I mean, God could probably take his arms and go like this and then go, I love you this much. Plus. (laughs) So listen, he erases our sin. He loves us with an everlasting love, and he takes our sin as far as the east is from the west, and it's gone. He doesn't see it anymore. So why do we as human beings hold on to it? All right? You got it? I'll cover it with this last one. And this is one a lot of people have, too, in their memory banks. If we, it's 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us just that one sin and keep us locked in unrighteousness. Okay, there's that reverse version again, right? I want you to grasp what he's saying here. John is saying this. If we confess our sins, which is, confess means to agree with God that it's not good. He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. He will purify us from all unrighteousness. In other words, you go to the Lord and say, Lord, I want you to forgive me. I sinned today. And he says, yes, come on, but I'm going to put you in the bathtub and I'm going to scrub you from all unrighteousness so that when you come out of that confession, you are whole and clean before me. That's God's love. Are you getting it now? That's the goodness of God. All right. I want to close with four takeaways. Because we go back to the blueprint here. And I have to hurry. All right, you okay? You okay to stay till two? (laughs) Takeaway number one, and this is is regarding the blueprint. Now we're going back and we're going to say this. We're individuals now. But takeaway number one is our pursuit of God is a necessary factor. You've heard Pastor talk about it. You've heard Angela talk about it. Ryan has been talking about it. But if we don't pursue the love of God and understand it, and you, we will never, ever change. I had to study this stuff. You know why I was able to change? It's because it was inside me. And you have to get into the word and you have to get into worship and you have to be with God's people and get into discipleship. This is working it every day. And, and folks, I always thought that, I was raised Catholic, by the way. I don't, how many Catholic people do we have here? Okay. So I always thought it was ritual. I was scared of God. You know, you have just so many Hail Mary and Our Fathers and all of this other stuff. I just walk around the building and just do whatever I needed to do. Then I learned that God's love, we can do nothing about. It's for us. And we don't have to do it. There's no ritual. He just says, you know, the thief on the cross looked over at Jesus and said, can I say the singer's sinner's prayer right now? (laughs) No. He just said, remember me. You could be on your deathbed and having not known Christ, but all of a sudden, all the seed planted is there, and all you have to do is say, Lord, help me, and he's there. He's there. So we need to pursue God. Why? Because he holds the truth about the blueprint, and he holds a better way than we have. <laughs> our ways are not his ways, and our thoughts not his thoughts, right? So we try to rewrite the, the blueprint, but... It's God's way. Takeaway number two, our individual well-being is an essential element. So what I'm saying here is that you have to be free yourself. You have to work on yourself. We need to have a humble view of ourselves and our behavior. We need to understand and realize how we have affected and how what we do affects others. Our change can influence others. Did you know that if your spouse, you're having trouble with your spouse, the best thing you can do is to change yourself? Now that's weird. What about her? I'm I'm pointing to Dorothy, my wife, so if you don't know that. 
And then God, God all of a sudden turns and says, yeah, but you change you. I, had, I take care of her. So when you take care of yourself, God takes care of others around you. And he gives you wisdom in dealing with those things, okay? So listen, self-awareness is the key. You have to be aware of what you need to change. And that means the three Ds don't work. The three Ds are denial, defensiveness, and deflection. And we do every one of them, right? Take away number three. Repair and strengthening of our marriage and relationships is important. So not only are we pursuing God and we're changing ourselves, now we begin to repair and strengthen our marriage and put it into God's blueprint. And our focus should be on ourselves and how we are affecting others, not on how others are affecting us. And when it comes to marriage, folks, I do not believe, and I've said this to people all the time, I do not believe that we have marital issues. There is no such thing as a marital issue. It's individual issues multiplied. <laughs> See, marital issues are just individual issues, and there's clash. And now we have a problem. Okay? And I said this to the, uh, to the 9 o'clock too, but Maury Oxman said this one time. He said, he says, 100% of all the conflicts that you have in your marriage comes from yourself. And you know what the scriptural evidence of that is? It's one of my favorite verses too, James 4.1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Now, that's a good question, right? What causes fights and quarrels among you? And it is my, the wife that I gave you. <laughs> she made you do it. She's the reason for the conflict. No. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Does it not come from the desires that battle within you? You want something and don't get it. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm wanting something from you, and I don't get it, so I'm going to fight you. It's not God's blueprint. All right? Our focus should be not on who's right and who's wrong. And I am big about this in marriage counseling. Our focus should not be on who is right and who is wrong. It's what you are doing in the relationship. It's the dance. So think about that in repairing your marriage and relationships. And of course, Ephesians 4.32 is really, really crucial because it gives us the blueprint. And it says kindness, compassion, and forgiveness is the key. We have to learn to do that. And the final takeaway, number four. And we're almost done. Repairing and strengthening our parenting not only benefits our children, but can also affect future generations. Repairing and strengthening our parenting not only benefits our children, but can also affect future generations. Folks, if you have an underage child that's living in you right now, I want us to understand part of God's blueprint is that we are the parents they are not. And too many times today the kids are taken over. And they're taken over because the parents have not been strong enough to do the blueprint the way God wants it to be. And it's time to make a change in that. We need emotional connection because that's the key here, is being able to get into the lives of your kids, to lead assertively but compassionately. And we need to kind of eliminate power struggles, and I know there's a lot that goes into this takeaway. We could do a whole message just on this one takeaway, but we've got to remove power struggles. I don't know why that fights happen when you have to tell the kids 25,000 times what to do. Kevin Lehman gave some great advice on that. He says, just say it once and walk away. But there has, to be, there has to be a discipline or a consequence. And the problem is we have to look at how we can get our kids back in the fold. And it is through consistency, and this is the repair of what is going on. Folks, I want us to understand here that we have a, a very important job to do in repairing the blueprint. So to conclude, I just want to say this. No matter where you are, and I said this at the Next Gen Conference, no matter where you are today, all right, no matter what you've done, no matter where you are in your individual life, in your marital life, in your parenting, and folks, I'm, I want to address, if you're here and you have adult children, how many of you have made mistakes? 
I got to tell you, you're not defined by their track in life. God has the ability to bring them back. Are you hearing me? Because one of the biggest regrets is when you see your kids doing things and you're saying, I should have done something different. But you can't go back and change it. You can change. If you're underage kids, you can change them now. You can change how you do things. You can repair it. You can ask God. You can, you can get with other people. You can disciple. You can get counseling and get help for what is going on. There's plenty out there. But what we have to do is we have to get rid of the regret and say, I'm going to make it right now. I'm going to have a relationship with my kids if they're young or they're in their own and let God take care of it. To conclude, our pursuit of God and his blueprint benefits us as individuals first. So then our marriages can be the strongest in working God's blueprint. Then our working of God's blueprint can be a benefit to our children who will hopefully carry God's blueprint to future generations. Amen? Let's stand today. It all starts with you. It all starts with us. It is us learning God's way. It is us practicing God's ways. It is us influencing our family God's way, no matter how old they may be. And it is God who will, infu- who will, he will affect future generations. Amen? I was, I was just kind of thinking and praying about what to do at the end of this. And Ori is helping me out. I feel like we need to make this altar a bucket to bring our regrets down. I want you to understand something. What we've talked about today is any regret that you have, you don't have to carry out of here. Now, I know we're going to feel it still, right? But the power has to be disarmed by God's love. So as we sing this song, don't be shy Come down, think about the regrets you want to give to the Lord. And nobody's going to pray with you right now. We just want to do this as one big prayer together, okay? And we want to be able to say, Lord, this is what I want to bring down. Don't be ashamed because shame will keep us back there instead of approaching God's love. God's love is right here. It's in this room. I just want you to have a simple little exercise. Bring your regrets to the Lord. Amen? 